If I could give anyone advice about working in remote Indigenous communities, or any community for that matter, I would emphasise the value of knowing a name. My priority when first coming into a community is to get the names of everyone you have come across down pat and map out where they fit into the community. This second part, as you can imagine, can drive you insane, as the family trees are twisted willows with branches going back and forth in all directions. You will go crazy trying to figure out who is really whose sister, brother, auntie, but as soon as you have a vague overview, you can put people's stories into some kind of context later down the track. But there is so much in a name, and if you can correctly name an individual out of a large group, you can disarm their reluctance to engage in a second. I know personally that I don't respond well to people who I've met multiple times but still don't remember my name, so I reflect this in my work and employ whatever strategies I can to ensure I get a name right. And you can be sure that as soon as you know everyone's names, they will know yours. I remember one of my first attempts to do so was simply grabbing a piece of chalk and writing them all down on a piece of cement near where we had our session set up and photographing it. We also use a photo attendance board at each of our sessions to help match the names to faces of anyone new to our community. Not only does this make our lives a lot easier, but a small thing such as this draws people from all corners of the community over to have a look and check the program out. I'm always eager to find out the names of new faces. We've got some really unique little characters out in Utopia. Baby Hercules probably takes the cake of names I've come across so far. Placemaking has been a major focus of my work from day one and has been a great way to get to know the communities. It has provided a point of participation in our service for many community members who may not necessarily have a direct caregiver relationship with the kids attending, but who are still keen to get involved in the program. When I first came out to Utopia, I really looked at the spaces we were running our sessions in, and over the first month or two, I observed how the spaces were used and how our service could work to collaborate and build on these spaces. This has been as simple as slapping some colourful paint on objects such as old drums lying around that we could use as a bench surface or something to hold our mats down in the wind. You can spot a few contact painted car bonnets around Utopia, which provide a great canvas for community signage. In one community we work in, we simply have a car bonnet sitting at the base of a tree we set up under for shade with a Thiele playgroup written on it, and this is all we need to define our space. The community realise and respect this area, and at times we have arrived to find that someone has cleared up some of the rubbish lying around or have cut a branch down that I had kept knocking my head on. These small gestures really affirm for us the acceptance of our work in these communities and an appreciation of our presence. We take a rather ordinary, nondescript patch of the community and transform it into a child-friendly community space that is respected and recognised as a place that the community comes together to learn with their children. We had a look at how and where communities are using their spaces and this formed the basis of where and how we would work. My favourite question in getting to know community members and caregivers participating in our program is, if I gave you a million dollars right now, what would you do with it and where would you go? The answers are always fascinating and help in understanding their worldview. Every so often, I'll bring a map of Australia along to a session and the conversations and questions that come from that as a trigger point are amazing. I can't even tell you the amount of times I've had to explain where Summer Bay is. For those of you who also don't know where it is, watch Home and Away and you'll find out. I love listening to the conversation that goes on around the stew pot during community cook-ups. When people are relaxed in an activity like this, you stumble across some great insights into their lives. I think the key is to have a little bit of something on offer for everyone in the community. Once they have found their point of entry to engage the service, whether it be to check out some photos, have a cup of tea, participate in something we're doing, you have them feeling a lot more comfortable in the space and more engaged with the program we're running with the children. I remember about two months into working out here, it was actually my birthday, and I was called over to a house to have a chat with a grandmother who regularly brought her granddaughter to our sessions. I walked over thinking, wow, I'm a year older, things are really happening for me, someone wants to talk about their child's development and transition to school, this is great. I couldn't help but laugh when I arrived and I was invited into the house to find they wanted me to fix their foxtel. So not the big leap forward in the program that I had thought I had made, but the other realisation was that the community were comfortable enough with me to invite me into their house and after that everyone knew my name. Now, I don't know a thing about AFL, but one thing I've learned very quickly working in a remote Indigenous community is that everyone, and I mean everyone, has a footy team. From babies only a few months old to the elders of the community. So I have quickly found it to be the most effective conversation starter and icebreaker with anyone you come across. 
what is your team? So if you know anything about the footy, you're on the road to success when it comes to Indigenous community engagement. Working on a remote mobile is a bit of a paradox. You have to be incredibly planned and organised, but you also have to be flexible enough to give all of that up in a second and change direction based on what's actually happening on the ground. Not being organised means forgetting one small piece of equipment that could be the key to your whole engagement activity for the session. However, you could also spend a whole weekend planning for an exciting session to arrive and find that everyone has left the community that week. After working remotely for closely a year, I have seen the service through a range of seasons and have learnt the importance of working with the environment. I've learnt that our service is one that will be continually changing and adapting to the natural, social and cultural landscapes of the communities we arrive in.